Hello everyone, welcome to the AOI Streams, in-depth conversations with digital artists and experts to explore how blockchain technology is impacting the future of art. AOI, also known as Art on Internet, is the movement for emerging art and technology. I'm Federica and today I'll be your host. In this episode, we invite generative and AR artist Zach Liberman to walk us through the creative process behind his 101 artwork for the first Inner Code group exhibition. <laughs> I'm so excited for this. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. This is our episode number three of our Masterclass Fridays. We're super, super excited today to have Zach Liberman, one of the incredible artists from the Inner Code exhibition with us today. Hi, Zach. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. So for those in the audience, I'm sure that most of you know, all of you know who Zach Lieberman is. So he's an artist and educator. He's based in New York City. He creates with code and he focuses on um, drawing and animation tools. He also creates this kind of like interactive environment where the participants become the performers. And we will then talk about this in a little bit because it's super, super interesting. He also the co-creator of Open Frameworks, which is an open source program for creative coding. And he helped co-found the School of Poetry Competition, which is a school examining the lyrical possibilities of code. And he's also currently a professor at MIT Media Lab. So a lot of exciting things that we, we can talk about today. Uh, incredible career, Zach. So Zach, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your career, how and when did it start? Yeah, sure. So yeah, just as a background, I'm based in New York. I divide my time in thirds. So one third teaching, one third doing artwork, one third doing commercial work. And to me, those are almost like three legs of a stool that I find really helpful for having a balanced career. In terms of how I got started with this, I studied fine art, painting and printmaking, and I had to get a job. And at that time, everybody was talking about web design and Y2K and the world's going to end in the year 2000. And I kind of lied my way into a job. I bluffed my way into a job and, you know, got a design job. And I discovered a tool called Flash, which was, you know, for all, I think for a lot of creative coders, it was kind of a gateway, a gateway experience where it, it, Flash was an animation tool, but you could write a line of code and you could, you know, at a keyframe, you could say X equals X plus one, you make an object move across the screen. And that moment... I had always loved animation. I'd always loved math. And, but I never, I didn't code. I wasn't into computers. I didn't, you know, I don't know. But at that moment, I discovered this possibility of language and motion, this relationship between typing something, between expressing an idea in words and seeing something move and seeing something come to life. And I was like totally hooked. And I saw a lot of the same energy. So I love the print studio. I love printmaking because it's very social and you're hanging out and you're making things together. And I saw a lot of that same energy around these kind of creative coding tools. That's super interesting. There's a lot of like mediums coming into your artistic career as well. And how did you learn about the NFT space and why did you decide to, to jump in the NFT space? Yeah, so I had been approached for years, you know, I, I was like, what is this? I don't know. It it, it sounded really foreign to me. I, I, you know, I was getting DMs from people, but it was a curator named Lindsay Howard. And Lindsay was a, a curator at um, Foundation. I think she's um, she's since moved on, but she, you know, invited me and she had curated, you know, many exhibitions that I really admire and worked with artists that I really admire. And I was like, okay, I'll try this. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. And the moment that I put something up, it was like this, almost like this light bulb moment. I remember many years ago, I had, uh, I was drinking, it I was in Japan with um, the Ars Electronica as this electronic arts festival. And I was drinking with the head of the festival. And he said, you know, all of the work that you do is going to disappear, right? The The things that you make, they're like, you know, the software is not going to run, the computers are going to die, you know, it's like, there's going to be a moment where, like, all of this work will be lost. And, and then like, there will be some time where the work can be saved, or there, or that we can, you know, there's going to be like some before and after moment. And I was like, I don't know, in the back of my head, like, what is this old guy talking about? But then I had this moment when I the, went to mint a work for the first time, where I was like, wow, there's actually, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I have this feeling like there's something really powerful in making a de decision to try to 
bring permanence into a digital work or to, to say like, this is something that I care so much about that I'm going to mint it and try to preserve it. And the, that was a really exciting moment for me. And, and then also the moment of, you know, seeing a first bid on, on a work, which was like, that was so much, you know, I felt like my heart was like, you know, uh, beating really fast. Like it was very, it was surprising. It was all super surprising. And I loved those like first moments and a lot of the art artists and projects on foundation were really interesting. And then um, Tezos and Hickenlook and, you know, it's been really cool to see all these different communities popping up in different locations. So this emotion that you said you felt when you had your first bid and and you you get your first sale, is it something that you still feel today when you when you sell something, when you have the options? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's exciting. I mean, I love the idea that work finds a home, right? That that it's like we're experimenting. It just feels like this experiment, you know, it's a very weird and interesting and sometimes chaotic. And you know, there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of weird energy, but for me, it's this idea of work finding a home. And I like I make prints and I sell prints and nothing makes me happier than just like putting a print in the mail and having that having that note. Somebody sends, you know, I don't know, puts on Twitter like I got a print from Zach. And it's just this idea that work is finding a home. And to me, that's exciting. So I, it's still exciting. Like after several years of this, it just feels like really thrilling. It's such a, a warm feeling when you see someone having a piece of your art in their home and it almost feels like a little piece of you is there right and they're yeah. like cherishing this part of yourself you're like cherishing this it's really like you it's like a reflection of yourself and and the idea that someone cares so much about that to like want to have it in their special like safe space yeah. it's so powerful i think it's something that as artists i don't think you ever get to like really get used to or like mm. um take for granted right it's uh yeah. it's very beautiful i wanted to jump a little bit on the topics like concepts behind uh your works yeah. and i don't know if you wanted to start sharing your screen already and show yeah. us a little bit about that i had prepared a presentation and i thought mm -hmm. you know i'll give a presentation happy to answer any questions i can't see i you might see me like look to the side because i have another mm -hmm. laptop with discord open but i can't even read it from here so feel free to jump in at any point if somebody's asking a question i'm happy to answer questions you know as i go but i have a short you know presentation about my work and i want to show some projects i'm really proud of and then maybe that can kind of open up a conversation about themes that i'm interested in i also have some material around the this particular work that's in this exhibition and the simulation of mm -hmm. light and i can even you know, I don't know how well it's going to work, but I can do a live demo and show kind of how I code and make the work. So absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. Let's go with that. All right. So a uh, quick introduction to myself. I used to look like this. I studied painting and printmaking. As I said, I was really happy and I had to get a job, uh, discovered Flash. Usually, like if I'm giving a talk, I'll kind of see in the audience, like who's nodding their head. And when I talk to young people, they don't know what I'm talking about. But like folks, folks my age or a little younger know. This was like such an incre incredible moment. But what I do, you know, is really I, I write software. Like from that moment, I discovered this language of coding and writing software in order to make images and to make motion. And I've been kind of really um, spent my life since I guess like the early 2000s doing this. And I make, um, again, yeah, images and videos and so on. I want to talk about some interactive work and show some of, um, projects I'm really proud of. I make a lot of work about drawing. I think because my background's in fine arts, I'm really frustrated with drawing tools. And so I try to build interactive work that explores drawing and with new, new possibilities. Um, so for example, this is a uh, drawing tool that takes something familiar like your phone, um, but then it uses the accelerometer. So as you rotate your phone, the drawing itself rotates in 3D. So I'm gonna play a short clip. So it's using, I really like the idea of something which is like familiar and unfamiliar. So taking the familiar interface of drawing and the kind of unfamiliar interface of like a, a screen using the, the orientation of the screen to rotate to make something interesting. And for me, there's something really exciting about making tools and putting them out there and seeing what people do with it. A lot of times like people making, you know, sort of childish things. There's a lot of this. Um, but what I really love is like this woman in South Korea drew this bird and I had no idea how she made it. Like I didn't know 
I don't know, you know, how she used the tool. And I love, I, in general, as an artist, as a creator, I love putting tools out into the world and seeing what people do with them. Um, this is a project that I did, um, was approached by Google, and th they have these satellite photographs from around the world, and they were looking for a, an interesting way of interaction with them. And I developed software before for some museum exhibits, and I was able to repurpose it here. And it's essentially a drawing tool where you draw, and when you draw, um, a curve, it finds that curve in a satellite photograph from around the world. So if you draw a hook, it finds a hook. If you draw a straight line, it finds a straight line. If you draw a, you know, an angle, it'll find an angle. If you draw a rectangle, it'll find a rectangle. And of course, this got on the front page of Reddit. So you can imagine what the internet was trying to draw. Um, it was really, really exciting and kind of disturbing. Um, and then, you know, these projects have this very pretty front end, but there's a lot of data science and kind of yeah computational work that happens on the back end and that's you know my job changes all the time like sometimes I'm thinking about kind of how to make something beautiful and elegant and playful and then I'm also like oh how do I match you know drawings um second part of this project is connecting the dominant um lines so finding like coastlines and highways and rivers and connecting them to make a, almost a kind of infinite um landscape so as you drag, it's taking images and stitching them together and making a kind of um, a, a landscape um, based on your drawing. And I want to talk about another kind of drawing project. And this leads into, you know, if we jump into talking about light and simulating light, but this is one of um, my experiments in, in that space. Um, one of my students, so I teach at the School for Poetic Computation. Now I teach at MIT at the Media Lab. And I had a student who was for his final project, trying to document all of the different ways you could tell a computer to draw a circle. So when you go to draw a circle, like if you're using processing or you know open frameworks or some tool, there's lots of different algorithms that are involved in drawing a circle. It's not so straightforward. And I thought of an idea, I thought of an approach, which was take a rectangle. And if you pick a random point on one of the four sides of the rectangle and you connect it to one of the three other sides. If that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. But if it doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. So it's a way of drawing by absence, where you're, the more lines you draw, you're kind of approximating a circle. And to me, this was so beautiful because you kind of like, it's like drawing the inverse of a circle in a way. So I tried words. I tried the word love. I tried a smiley face. It didn't look that great. But then I was thinking, well, what if those lines were like rays of light? What if they could bounce off of the letter forms? So I started to experiment with code in thinking of the kind of algorithms for light simulation. So thinking about the, the, those lines as rays of light and having them bounce off the letter forms and um, reflect and refract. And a lot of times my projects start at sketches where I'm just working through the kind of mechanics of an idea. And then I take those sketches and I build tools or interactive tools. Um, so for example, this is an installation where I'm inviting people to come and, and play with the lights. So I've laser cut pieces and they can kind of, they're setting the, the boundaries for the light to bounce off of. So it's a light table and you come, you can come, there are pieces and, um, there's a button you can press to change where the light is coming from. And what I love about projects like this is they really start with your body, right? You come to it and you see yourself, but then it kind of goes from your body to your mind and then back to your body. And to me, there's something very beautiful about that pathway of body, mind, body. And I love light. So, I mean, if we get into it, I'll talk about some other, you know, light related work because the project in this exhibition is, um, is, uh, is using light. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of sketches about the body, thinking of kind of how can we, you know, augment the body in different ways. Um, my partner and I just do this all day, hang out, make weird stuff. Um, and thinking about, you know, my students at the Media Lab, thinking about kind of how we can take something simple, like just understanding where your fingers are and build new forms of interaction, like a hamburger um, or using, you know, the this like some, yeah, again, it's this idea of familiar and unfamiliar, taking something familiar, like the movement of your fingers and creating an unfamiliar um, interaction. 
I'm going to jump ahead and then I'm happy to talk about things. I'm quite interested in augmented reality. So specifically, you know, what does it mean if we know where a, a device is in space that we know like a microphone and a screen and a speaker and a display? I think we can ask really interesting questions about what these things are that we now that we know where they are in the world. So for example, this is an experiment taking photographs and having the photographs stay in the air where you took them. So you take an image and the image kind of hovers in 3D where it was taken. So it allows you to create almost a kind of fragmentary world of images or taking frames of video and having the video stay in the air where you took them. So then you can walk through the video and with your body, you're like a play, you're the playhead, you're scrubbing through the video with your movements. So as you speed up or slow down, the video speeds up or slows down. This is taking images and breaking them into pieces. So you see almost a kind of fragmentary world where you can see the world in you know, one vantage point where it looks correct. And then um, you know, it's broken into all kinds of pieces or taking color pixels from the world, taking the color of the world and the texture of the world and then painting that back into the world. A lot of weird stuff. Um, I don't know how to explain. Uh, I don't know if you can you hear audio. I'm not sure if you can hear my computer or not. I can't hear uh, it. No, we can't. Okay. We can't hear the, the audio from that, but it's okay. No okay. All right. I'm, you have to use your imagination. So this is recording the recording sound in space. And then when you walk through it, it replays. So it's it's a way of recording your voice. But then it's almost like you can scrub through it and play it forwards and backwards as you move through the sound. And is the is the drawing um, a visual representation of the sound that you make? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can play. It. I don't know if I play it loud enough. If you hear it here, this is. And have you done? Sorry, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm off. I've got like a gazillion questions. Yeah, have you done the opposite, creating yeah. sound based on the type of image or or based on the drawing? Uh, no, I've done stuff that where we've sonified like turn turn sounds, turn drawings, and turn them into sound, but not it not through AR. But I've done stuff, okay. you know, in that in that realm. Um, this is a tool for collage where you can take photographs from the world and then put them back into the world. So almost making um, like, you know, I don't know, this is what we do all day, like make weird portraits, make weird, weird experiments. But I, again, I love making tools here. Somebody took that tool and they made a three dimensional sandwich. So they took photographs of all the elements of a sandwich and then using this AR tool, put it back in um, back in 3D. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't know how to explain what, what we're doing. We're messing around a lot, you know, recording the body, trying to bring the body into AR. A lot of experiments that I, again, I don't really know how to explain. You know what I, what I really love about this is that you can tell that they're obviously, you know, you're creating something like, I don't even know how to explain it because yeah. it's, it's weird, it's different. But the, the thing is, um, you make it look like, it could be real, you know what I mean? So yeah. there's this there's this part of me that I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, this is real. But also it almost looks like it could definitely be a reality mm. somehow. Mm. Um, and so I really love this that you were saying before the connection that you said between, mm. you know, coming from the body to the mind and to the body again. Yeah. Because it's almost like first you, you start from a very like, I don't even know if, I can say traditional, like realistic view mm. of the body or, or the reality, or like what we think as the reality is. Mm. We start from that and it's like, I see it as the, the body part. Yeah. And then you go to the mind and you're like, okay, the mind can also go beyond that. Mm. And then when you come back to the body, you're like, okay, this was different, but it feels weird. I don't know how to mm. explain it, but it mm. feels like this could be, potentially like I could walk around and see something like this mm. and it wouldn't be, you know what I mean? Like it wouldn't be that weird. It would be like, it's possible. <laughs> for some yeah. Reason. Yeah. I, mean, I, I love this. Yeah. I think these are like, you know, there are in a way I, I feel like this is almost trying to develop a grammar, like the, that AR is this tool for exploring the poetics of space. What does it mean to move through space and be able to create, images and content that have a spatial awareness yeah. and that AR is a kind of, you know, it is a vehicle for exploring our 
body's movement in space and and transforming it in in new ways so um we've we've got yeah. tons of reactions in, in yeah. the audience <laughs> i want to i want to show one thing about education and then um i'm happy sure. to to like you know go back to a conversation answer questions so i teach a class um called recreating the past and i do have taught this for you know years and years i've, ta I've taught it at um school for Reporter computation i teach it at mit at the media lab now and it's in in a lot of ways inspired by this book by Osama Sato called The Art of Computer Designing. This is a book from 1993 by a designer from Japan. And I fell in love with this book. Like this book is amazing. It's like all of these cool ideas of things you can do with the computer and how, how you can use it for design. And in the end, he's thanking people. And he said, I would like to acknowledge my favorites, Russian avant-garde, futurism and Bauhaus, whose brilliant typefaces and designs have in many ways shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive now to work with computers, I am certain they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And this sentence, I, I love this sentence. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. I think there's something really powerful there. For students in particular, this idea that the past is there to be recreated, to be remade, and that it's both an obligation and a gift. That it's like it's your job and i mean it's a gift that there are these great artworks and artists that you can have a conversation with but it's also your job to um to recreate the work of the past with today's voice with today's intention with today's tools so i teach a class where every week i talk about a different artist and designer so for example muriel cooper who helped create the mit media lab she had a group there called the visual language workshop that did a lot of the early really interesting early work with typography and 3d um, and so we study her work. Uh, I talk about an artist named Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist who lives in Paris now. And since the 70s, she's been writing code to control a pen plotter and make, you know, algorithmic drawings. And w every week I introduce a different artist. And then the homework assignment is to pick one artwork and recreate it, to have a kind of conversation with the artwork where you're almost reverse engineering it, taking it apart, and then recreating it with a modern tool like P5. JS or open frameworks. And we were invited to show the work at a festival um, in Houston. And usually when you see artwork that's created with code, you just see the outputs. But we wanted to show the code and the visual side by side. We wanted the language, the text to be as important as the, as the visual output. So we suggested showing both. And we created this installation. And what you're seeing are actually homework. So at the top, it says artwork by Bridget Riley, recoded by and the name of the student. Um, and you're seeing the the homeworks that my students made um, in in response to these artists. So um, I'll just play a short clip so you can see. So you can actually see when numbers change or some letters change in the code, you see a corresponding change in the visual. And People thought we were typing, which would have been really impressive if we were like, could type these live, which would, you know, we were not, but the next version of the project. But you, here you can see a kind of like, as numbers change in the code, you can see a corresponding change in the visual. Um, and so this was a way of, it was almost like a film festival for people who may not be familiar with code or kind of the field of creative coding to get a sense of, the language and the words you don't need even even need to read the code but you understand there's a relationship between the numbers and the words and the output and the whole idea is to kind of get um, people introduced to these artists and the work of my students um all right cool happy to answer question okay so we've got uh, well first of all everybody's saying they want to get their hands yeah. on, on 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 some of these tools and i want also to know is it possible yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the stuff. So, for example, with the AR work, um, there's an app that we have called Weird Type, which is a tool for doing typography in AR. Um, there's another one called Weird Cuts, which is the collage tool. So, those tools exist. They're on, um, you can find them. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, some of the stuff, like, for example, the audio and spit, like, there are demos that I have that are not like I haven't released or I don't know how to release them. So some stuff is not, doesn't necessarily exist. It's things you can try. Um, I had showed uh, the the landlines project and that's a, that's a website. You can try that, that's online. Cool. Well, the first question actually um, was about 
a curiosity about why why your animations aren't shared or looked at as often as uh, the stills. Um, yeah. So do you have an answer for that? Yeah, I don't even know if I understand the question. So I post a lot, like I do daily sketching. Um, uh, let me see, Instagram, Zachary Marin. I've been doing daily sketches since about 2016. I'm not like, you know, religious about it. Sometimes I might miss a day or two. I'm not like, um, you know, sometimes I might post like five things in a day, but I post um, a lot of both images and and uh, video. There are some limitations. So for example, certain videos don't compress well or don't look, you know, there are lim these limitations where you have like, I don't know, square aspect ratio or, you know, people are looking at it on their phone. They might not have, you know, subtle stuff might get lost. But I tend to share a lot of motion. In the last year or maybe year and a half, I've been doing like tons of images. So I will just post, you know, I'll have a lot of posts where I just am like, here's all these variations of images. And I share, I, images share really well. So I have been kind of in a way, I wouldn't say more focused on images, but it's part of, you know, I've been trying to figure out how can I convey movement and energy and kinetic energy in an image. So I've been going back and forth, but I don't, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question because I share both, um, you know, images and-, and Okay, uh, maybe, as you said, maybe maybe um, some of the stills get picked yeah. up more. Um, that's probably yeah. what, they, what they had reference to. Yeah. Um, so you've been working with, with augmented reality. How about virtual reality? Have you guys ventured into that? So I haven't done a lot of work with VR. I think there are lots of potential for it. I To me, there's something, I like about social artwork. So VR feels really not antisocial, but my experience of VR, like always, I will always go to an art exhibit that has VR and it's like, I'm waiting in line, I'm waiting in line. I put on the headset and nobody can really participate or see what I'm seeing. And I always have this feeling like, oh, I could do this at home. Like, why am I in a gallery or why am I in a, in a museum? There's something so powerful about walking into a space, even if you're just, you know, looking at paintings with people, the idea that there's a room of paintings and maybe like two people congregate by the same painting. And you, there's there's so so much joy in, in experiencing work with other people, being able to say, you know, like see how people respond to it or even how long they take, you know, with different works. And um, at VR to me feels really like the social component is the thing that I have trouble with. Um, I have had really amazing experiences with VR. So I, I do think it is a real valid art form. I just don't, I personally, I love the kind of social component of interactive work. So it has been a platform that I've shied away from. Um, what would you tell someone that wants to get started today? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, find communities. The most important thing I have found in general is knowing like you're not alone. When you're coding, it you know, especially if you're kind of getting into this field, it can be, feel really frustrating when you're programming, you're both the, the criminal and the detective. Like it's a really weird, you know, it's like you and the machine, you know, it's not a very social activity. And if you can find a community where you can share code examples and ask questions, I would say that's like the most important thing. So, and a lot of times these tools are really kind of fronts for community. So something like P5JS is is like a really warm and welcoming community. It's like the tool is important, but what what's even more important are the people around the tool. Beautiful. Uh, they uh, also asked what the course is that you're teaching at MIT. What's yeah, so I teach a class, um, let's see, it's recreating the past, um, this course that I teach, yeah, pretty much every um, every semester. I'm not teaching it this semester. I'm teaching a different course, but I teach it quite often. Um, it's and sometimes I teach it with SFEC online, or you know, I teach it in different ways. So I think I need to turn on Do Not Disturb. Sorry about the all the email sounds. Great question from uh, Prakash. Can you share what some of the common pain points of your students are? Like, what are some of the Ooh, things that they struggle? Yeah. With? Hmm. Especially I mean, when starting out. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that you, when you're just getting started, one of the biggest things is vocabulary. You don't know the words. You don't know how to formulate. Like, if you don't know the words, you don't know how to ask the question. And if you don't know how to ask the question, you get really stuck. So the main thing that I concentrate on with beginners, beginners, or folks that are just getting started is like, what is the word? What are the languages? What are, how do we describe this work? So that when you get stuck, when you have a question, you ask. And that is like probably the biggest thing. And then I would say 
like learning different things has, there's different learning curves. So for example, if you're learning the piano, it's kind of like easy to begin and then it gets really hard, right? Like it's like super simple to get started with the piano, but it can get like, you know, frustratingly complex. But learning the guitar is like really hard at the beginning. Like it's physically hard, your finger, you get calluses, it's really challenging. So I think understanding the learning curve and code can be quite, you know, challenging at the beginning where you're, you know, a lot of it is like about syntax and, you know, all of these like minute things that where you can go from something working to not working, you know, really quickly. So um, I think understanding learning curves. And then the last thing that I think is important is that a lot of students feel frustrated. You know, I don't know, like in America, we have, um, I don't know if it's like this everywhere in the world, but we have like a highway and then you have a slow road next to the highway. So like everybody's driving on the highway really, really quickly, but if you're on the service road, it's like really slow. And I think a lot of students feel like they're kind of on the service road, you know, and they can see the highway, they can see, you know, they can see the cars moving quickly, but they can't figure out kind of the on-ramp. And I think our job as teachers or as educators is to kind of find those on-ramps for students, you know, but there's like, I think that's definitely a frustration that I see a lot of students have. Um, there was a there was a question about the the language. So is it is it a, a JavaScript language? And if not, what kind of language are you using? So I program mostly in open frameworks, which is C plus plus, and I write a lot of shader code, which is it's like a di dialect of C, and that is common across all. You know, you can write that in JavaScript. Um, I do things in P5JS. I use three JS sometimes, um, but mostly open frameworks, C plus okay. plus. Yeah. Okay. It seems to me, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm I'm going to pick up my kids. <laughs> and the question. Um, it seems to me like this could be, and in fact, I'm going to have a conversation with the arts teacher um, yeah. in two weeks. Yeah. Because I want I want them to integrate digital art in the curriculum somehow. Yeah. And, yeah. and because I have this great privilege of talking to people like yourself, I feel like the responsibility that I should talk to them about it and be like, this is so amazing. <laughs> um, so, so it feels to me, and when I look at these people, you know, look at this guy, yeah. they're having so much fun and it's so intuitive. Yeah. I, it feels to me like this could be the perfect onboarding for kids into coding yeah. and art at the same time. So yeah. I would love to know if there's something out there um, that I could use and test with my kids to see if I can get them excited. Yeah, I mean, I'm for sure I would look at Scratch, which is a tool that's developed at MIT that is like a great onboarding tool for learning code. And um, there are all kinds of cool creative things that you can do with it. So um, I also am a big fan of physical computing with children. So using things like Makey Makey or Arduinos, where you're learning about electronics and building instruments and building kind of like circuits I, that is like way fun like super super fun so um i think like coding is one thing but i think also like anything that's physical and a lot involves you like cutting materials and making things can be really like a joy there's so many so many points that we touched yeah. with the questions that i i kind of wanted to expand on because yeah. they were already like in my in my questions that i that i had prepared and i love that the community mm -hmm. aligned with me on that um one thing that really made me think um, about expanding the topic. So when um, someone was asking about your experience in VR and you were saying that um, you're not really a big fan of it because of the social component that you think is a little bit missing in that. Um, and I really see, you know, I, I can definitely see this argument that you're giving in, in the way that, you know, you create your interactive experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to expand a little bit on this. So why do you think it's important to have this sort of like interactive experiences and, you know, is this something related to kind of like bringing the, the human back to, or like not bringing it back, but like connecting the human with the machine. Um, mm. And like generally, like what is the kind of interaction that you always hope for the audience to have? Yeah. So there's, I have a project from many years ago called Drawn, which is a, it's like a painting tool where you paint, but you can actually touch the paint and the paint comes to life. And there is like a, a very concrete moment. I captured this, this child. It was at a um, festival for children in Amsterdam called Cinekid. And there's this moment where you can see like 
this finger is coming in and it's touching the paint and you can see her mouth open. She's just watching and you see her like go from like mouth closed to mouth open, like just complete surprise. And to me, that is what I'm after. Like this moment of wonder, this moment of surprise. If you ever see, you know, I don't know, it's very cheesy, but I love watching um, with my um, 13 year old. We watch a lot of magic on like on YouTube and there's these moments, which is just like, you're like, what just happened? Like what, you know, that moment of surprise, that moment of wonder, I think that's a pathway to reach people's hearts. So if I think about what I'm after with interactive work is, is a moment of surprise, a moment of wonder. Actually, another topic that the, they brought up with the yeah. questions from the community I wanted to expand on, which is kind of like the, the teaching part of yeah. uh, your career and how, you know, it's very important to talk about the past. Yeah. Um, and when I was uh, reading about your course and now that I was hearing about it, um, it really, um, it really reminded me of something that uh, AOI, like the AOI mm. founder, was saying last week um, in the podcast with Unit, and he was saying that inner code is really about, you know, diving into the past to create yeah. the future. So I really love how, you know, you we can definitely tell that your vision mm. really aligns with our project of um, inner code. I would love to know what do you think the the kind of like future development of teaching code will be like? And do you think mm. at, at the moment, is there a lot of um, courses, is there a lot of education that regards the past or is this still something that needs to be developed a little bit more? I mean, I think we should be, so I, I really love um, any like project or undertaking that's about kind of celebrating the past, talking about the artists that come before. We have a tendency in that sort of, like technological art world to think like we're we're different what we're doing is different we're on the edge of something and it feels like you know that's a trap like we are we are in conversation with and in in relationship to a whole field of research kinetic art and op art and all of these kind of like these artists are really important we need to be talking to them we need to be telling their stories there's also like the the first you know, first or second generation of media artists are passing away, you know, which is like, there are like, I met, I showed a slide of Vera Mulner. Vera Mulner is like 99 years old or a hundred years old. I, I think she just turned a hundred. It's like, we need to be, we need to be telling their stories. Like we need to be, we need to be listening to them. We need to be learning about them. We need to be sharing their stories and capturing that because you know, our work is built off of their work. Like our work is in conversation with their work. So I think the past is really important. We have a tendency, like, I don't know, I teach at the Media Lab and there's a tendency to just like everybody's, you know, sci-fi, future oriented. What is the world going to look like in 20 years? But I kind of want, I think for students, there's so much rich material to be like, they should be positioned looking forward, but also with an eye towards the past and also with an eye, you know, in terms of having conversation. Um, sorry, maybe there was a second part to your question. <laughs> no, 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 I, you replied perfectly. Um, I was yeah. wondering if, you know, there, in the future, you see the, how do you see the teaching yeah. Yeah. code? And if, um, yeah. how would you see the development of this? Because this is yeah. pretty, this, for example, the poetic computation, I would love for you to talk about a little bit about that. Um, yeah. It's quite, it's very innovative and there's not many, many courses, there's not many um, type of education regarding coding that are trying to, you know, combine this idea that, you know, it's not just numbers, but it's also yeah. about poetry as well. Um, yeah. Do you see that in the future is going to go towards more of that side, that path? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I think it's, you know, we should be thinking about if you're in the field of education, if you're in the field of creative coding, you should be thinking about kind of what are the tools for the next generation. And that's what I ask my students at the Media Lab to be thinking about. And I have actually have no idea. Like, I really don't have a clear insight. But I think new tools, new platforms, new institutions, they give us a chance to like reimagine what we're doing. You know, it. it I remember doing creative coding before processing. I remember doing, you know, physical computing before Arduino and it was super hard. It was so hard. It was so really, really challenging. And when those tools came out, they lowered the floor, they raised the ceiling, they created new languages for talking about creative code. And I think it's important to be thinking as 
as creators, you know, not only are we making work, but can we be making platforms and tools and institutions that do the same thing? And, you know, what are the next generation of those things look like? I have no idea. I do know, you know, I'm not sure I, you know, I write C++. It's like a old language, right? It's like really, really old. And I, you know, I don't know if we should be writing for loops in 20 years. Like, I, I just have no idea. Like, I think we need to have a radical imagination about what possibilities are, what new interfaces are. That in in that case, we, you know, and in addition to making cool work or, or cool projects, we need to be making tools and platforms and institutions to help expand the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's someone um, that was talking a little bit about your strategy when it comes to like posting your sketches. And I have yeah. a, a similar question um, because in the past few episodes we had, you know, we had Tyler Ops, we had um, Emily Shea, Kaz yeah. Reese, William Pan and Shiyu. Yeah. And uh, we we're all talking to them about, you know, um, their sketches. Yeah. And it's always interesting because um, most like actually all of them told me that they have this like sketchbook where they like draw their like inspirations they they draw mm. their ideas but they yeah. never share this with anyone it's like yeah their safe space and don't want to share it so i wanted to ask you like what made you decide to like share all of your sketches even though they're not like you know final probably yeah. final uh, results yeah so i actually i showed that project with my students where they made all of those sketches like that that homework assignment yeah and I love that so much, seeing the work that they made, that I got excited. That's really what, when I started doing daily sketches. So um, it really kind of came from that. And I'm just going through my every, I have this folder called Every Day. It's, um, I don't know, uh, um, 899 gigabytes. And it's like, oh, wow. it's it's, you know, and I try to, I don't post everything, but I try mm -hmm. to, as I make something, if I make something that I'm proud of or excited about, or just something that that I'm frustrated with, I post it mm -hmm. and I try to get the barrier. To me, it it feels like um, if you can lower the barrier to publishing, you understand your work depending on how people see it, right? You you actually learn about your work through other people's eyes, and when you put work out there, it you can learn and grow as an artist. So for me, it's like very important to work in an open way. And that almost like my, my posting is my, is my diary. My posting is my sketchbook. You know, it, it, it is that like, you know, that space. That's beautiful. You put it in such a beautiful way because what we usually hear um, and myself included, I could say it's such a, we're such like <laughs> afraid <laughs> to like post something that you haven't yeah. finished yet. Because yeah. exactly because of that judgment of people or even like even just the feedback, yeah. right? Maybe you're not ready for that. And I love yeah. that you do the opposite. You're like, you're, you're, I'm breaking, you know, my barriers. I'm going out of my comfort zone. I'm putting yeah. out things that might not be ready. I might not, uh, you know, like them in a couple of weeks, but it doesn't really matter because it's what I'm working on at the moment. So I find it like very, very beautiful. I remember I had a student, Evan Roth, and he built a WordPress plugin that just made the applause noise when you hit publish. It just took the publish button and made the sound effect, which is the people cheering. And I try, I think about that all the time when I'm, I try to, I think that is really important. If you can mentally have that feeling of like applause, like it's so cheesy, like it's a applause sound effect. But if you can feel that feeling of like, I'm putting stuff in the world. And I, the other thing that I think about is like, I almost wish there was a tool, you know, sits on top of your, you know, your menu bar. And it just says like, upload versus download. How much are you creating and putting out into the world versus how much are you consuming? And if you get into this habit where you're just like making and sharing and making and sharing, I, I kind of like, to me, it's that ratio of like, I want to put more out into the world than I consume. I kind of want to like, yeah, change that ratio in some way. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, we have a question that I think would yeah. really tie very well with um, our next card that I would think we can jump into the... Yeah work for the inner code and exhibition yeah. so the question is um, when you have an idea for a piece or a series does your inspiration usually begin from outside so like nature other work or community or you're just playing with code and tools until you discover something cool you know it really depends sometimes it's an algorithm sometimes it's an artist like oftentimes i'll make work in conversation with an artist that i discover um you know, I will like get really inspired by a, an artwork and try to understand why or what I'm feeling. And um, 
you know, so it will be, it, it'll come from a, almost trying to have a conversation or interrogation of that. Like, what am I feeling at that moment through, you know, I will create something in order to respond to that. And sometimes it's about kind of remixing that I think a lot of creativity is not about making something new, but just like remixing and remixing and remixing. So it's almost a kind of creative challenge to say, how can I, how can I make something new with something old? How can I take something that exists and like, what is the, even the smallest change that makes something new? It's, a, it's like a game that I really enjoy playing that I think like, you know, people think about creativity, like, oh, I'm going to start with a blank piece of paper every day. But actually, if you just say, I'm going to change something every day, I'm going to modify something every day. You, I think it's like a, a better way to think about it or a different way to think about it. Mm -hmm. And then a question that comes up to me just now is, when do you stop? Like, when do you choose, like, <laughs> the final? <laughs> when is, you know what I mean? Like, when am I yeah. going to stop with it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you stop. I always stop when I get bored. I stop when I um, see something that I've never seen before. So I will post things that I'm really excited about where I'm like, oh, I, I, this is something new. Like I've seen, I see something new. I'm excited or, or surprised. Um, and then where it, I think where it stops is when oftentimes I pivot when I get bored or I feel uncomfortable. And I think a, a lot of it is like exploring known and unknown. So for example, if you come to, you know, when you travel, you come to a new city and you go to, you know, you're like walking around and, and you come to a, like a cool park and that's exciting and you might hang out there and then you like turn the corner and it's a weird neighborhood. You don't feel comfortable. You'll walk back, you know, and you'll go, you'll experiment with between known and unknown. And I think the creative process is the same way where you're really navigating known and unknown and trying to find, um, yeah, the best way through. Awesome. Um, I would like you to walk us through the process yeah. for the piece of inner code, a global yeah. world. That's okay. Yeah. 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 So I am, um, I mentioned before, like super fascinated with light. I do a lot of sketches that are about kind of simulating light, thinking about the relationship of light, motion, and, and color. Um, and I want to mention a few artists that are really inspiring for me. Um, Abraham Palodnik, a Brazilian artist. And I just like love these light. They're, these are, um, kinetic artworks that have like real physical <laughs> lights in them um, and he's painting with light and I, when I think about my shader code or the code that I'm writing I think it's like it's kind of like the inside of this box like I kind of hang out on the inside of this box all day and what you see or what I'm posting is like the right side but like my experience or my life is like I'm like in this box on the left side um, artists like Dan Flavin I just love like this kind of the idea that you can um have a light source and really, yeah, make paint, really paint with it, really create space with it. There's an artist named James Clark, a light artist who I really admire. Um, and I just love this kind of like this approach. Um, and then my partner Momo, uh, we have a studio together and she's been taking neon classes and it's been so fun. Like I love neon and she builds all this weird stuff. Like she built a bicycle helmet with a neon flame and I'm like <laughs> driving behind her trying not to crash um, and photograph her. Uh, and every day I come into the studio and there's some new neon work, which is really inspiring. Um, and so I do a lot of sketches that are about light, about the simulation of light in different ways, whether it's kind of bouncing rays or using different algorithms. Um, and I've been thinking about kind of from a software perspective, how can we create light and then paint with it and, and create new forms of interaction? Um, and I also do sketches that are like they feel like they're documenting light in different ways like they're color based but they're coming from um they i think they're like color explorations but they're really also light explorations where i'm trying to understand kind of like uh, the same way like you know in those palatinic works you have these light bulbs i'm kind of like oh let me position these sources in different ways and see what happens and see what the resulting image is um and then recently i've been doing a lot of work that is like very close to almost, it feels almost like neon. I'm writing it in software, but it feels like I'm simulating um, <clears throat> a kind of neon light. So, um, you know, I just draw the lines, but the software is simulating all of the colors as if the lights were um, moving across the, like as if it was a real surface. <clears throat> and for me, this is really exciting. I, I'm not like, you know, um, I don't, 
oftentimes I find an algorithm or an idea and I don't 100% know what to do with it, but I do a lot of experimentation to figure out the language and the grammar of it and so on. Um, and I've been experimenting a lot with um, these different approaches. And one cool thing is that the diagnostic screen, so like what you see on the left side is like the output, but then the images that you need to make in order to get the output are so beautiful. Like the, I don't post a lot of these, but the ones on the right side, which are like, that's the, that's the data source, or that is the kind of like intermediate step. I love them. They look so weird. Um, and then this work that I'm presenting is in, you know, in the, in our code exhibit is inspired. This is the first computer film um, from Bell Labs. And this is a, like a one minute, 20 second film of a rotating globe. It's a saddle. It's a basically a, um, a demonstration of a satellite, but I love, I really love like all of these old films, like from the Bell Labs, like, you know, Ken Knowlton, B flicks, this kind of energy to me is really interesting. And there's something about this kind of rotating globe form that I'm fascinated with. And I've done a bunch of sketches that have used that in different ways. Um, and so was, this, uh, are... yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. Just had a quick question. I was reading that um, <clears throat> this uh, show movie that you were showing us just now, is it like the first 3D animation? Is it's that the correct? First, it, it's the first computer film. It's computer the first, film. it's the first film created by computer, as far as okay. I understand from 1963. Um, and so this work, uh, it's not playing. Let me see if I can find it. Um, it's like gigantic. I put it in the deck. It's like 2160 by, it's like nine gigabytes. So maybe it's too too much for keynote, but it's a, a minute. It's about the same, like it's a little longer. It's like a minute and 30 minutes, but I wanted to just focus on this kind of like the joy of rotation of just seeing these lights kind of spin. Um, let me just set it up to, um, seeing what it feels like the, when these lights are moving around and when they're spinning and even going into the globe. So kind of having a bit of a camera movement saying, let me pull out a little bit, let me pull in a little bit. And um, and I, I wanted to make something that felt like not so mathematical. I didn't want it to feel like a kind of like a geometry experiment, but actually have a little bit of a kind of like a wavy quality and a, a loose quality. Um, and to me, there's some really nice moments when you come into the globe and then it's like very abstracted. It, it really kind of, at this moment, it's like about light, you know, more than anything else. Absolutely. This part, yeah. when you enter into the globe, it like yeah. gives me goosebumps. Yeah. It's like, wow, I'm really in that. I don't know why. Yeah. It's really yeah. like, it's powerful. It really gives yeah. me the idea that I'm like in that yeah. world. There's something really interesting too, which is the kind of mathematics of what happens when you project these points and you're really like playing with kind of 2D and 3D. And then the, you wind up with these ones that just come, they all sort of come in the center. You know, you have all of these, like, it's almost like a straight line. It's like this moment of weirdness yeah. that I like, I think it's like, so like, it's these little things that like that, that are like, make me so happy when, when I discover them. Um, and then I can show, um, I, if you want, I can show you the software or I'll show you how I write the software. Absolutely, please. The audience is asking for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually have a question <laughs> if I can jump in already. Yeah. Uh, someone, uh, Arm Club is asking, yeah. how do you feel about making specific works versus long form uh, generative algorithms? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a preference and how are the challenges different? Yeah, so I have only done one long form work and I, I wrote about it on my Medium. I did a project with um, Iskra that um, I'm super proud of and super like, it's a really interesting and kind of challenging form. Um, let me just pull up the article. Medium, Zach. Um, so I wrote this article here. So I like, um, not to like, point people to my article but just to say like it's actually really it I think it's really interesting and and kind of stressful um I love the idea that you're creating artwork that's on chain I think that's really interesting the idea that you're creating um like something where it's about sort of telling telling stories through the variations but I had this experience like a year ago when I was going to do an art blocks drop and I felt like so <clears throat> so much anxiety about not knowing 
it was, I felt like, cause I have a little bit of an addictive quality, like I can easily get addicted to things. And I just felt my, I found myself like just refreshing, like hitting the screen. It's the sort of not knowing the unknown that is inter that is the power of this art form, but also like the thing that can make you a little crazy because you're kind of like, I, you know, I'm so used to curating. I'm so used to pulling out and saying like, here, here, I feel like a wildlife photographer. I'm trying to find the best examples of the things that I've made. And then here's this art form where it's like, you're giving up that control. And it kind of like, if you want to play it safe, it, you then you can limit the, the space. But I almost, I really like stuff to be at the edge of being unsafe. I really like stuff to be almost broken or to make images that are really surprising or really shocking. So. Um, I would say I like it. It's hard. Um, I'm doing it again with bright moments, which I'm really excited about for um for uh in um in Mexico City. Um and then I wrote this medium post where I'm like, oh, it's so it's so calm, I'm so happy. You know, I was like really like, you know, I wrote about how stressful it was and like how happy it was. And then like we had this technical problem, and then I had to go fix it and spend like a week you know, getting PC computers out of storage and reverse and deep, you know, debugging and so on. So um, I don't know. I like, I, I'm totally fascinated with it, but I, it's, it's not a form that I find like supernatural, I would say. Thank you. And thank you, Arplet, for the, for the question. We can then share the screen, the, the link later, we can share it maybe yeah. on the, on the chat after the session. Yeah. Right. Um. Let's move on with the with the demo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was demo. I was demonstrating something. So <laughs> let me pull up. Um. Um. So probably shouldn't you know say say this, but I'm doing like little like sometimes I get commissioned to do uh like an artwork from a um, company. So here, Apple wants some artwork for a playlist or something. So I probably broke an NDA by saying that, but um, here I'm like, I am sketching. And so I will start with like some idea. I have some previous sketch that they liked, which involved, um, you know, a kind of grid. And I love these, um, it's like this very like warm palette, this like browns and blues. Um, my partner hates it. She always makes fun of me because I go back to this palette all the time. Um, and I oftentimes when I'm sketching, I'll just have different ideas where I'll try like um, I'll try, you know, like, let me let me adjust something. Let me adjust something. And the art form itself is like all it's all tweaking. All you're doing all day is saying like, um, you know, let me change like a number here, a number here. People think of coding as like, you're just like writing code, writing code, writing code. But I think so much of it is just like number, number changes um, and just experimenting and saying, okay, what happens if I try, what it, what happens if I try this? What happens if I try this? What happens if I try this? So um, these are all pretty chill, but I could try, I don't know if this is um, like, you know, I have some like not chill parts of it, you know, and I can, a lot of times what I'm doing is experimenting and saying like, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? And, um, and most of what I do all day is like, hang out here. Like I'm in the numbers and I'm saying, you know, let me try, let me try making it super bright and seeing like, now it's a little bit blown out, you know, and I will like, I spend a lot of time like adjusting numbers, <laughs> like pretty much what I do all day is like, hang out and and change numbers. Do you have any helpful to you see? Have, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, this is awesome. Do you yeah. have any like uh, behind the scenes from the um, <clears throat> a global world? Um, I saw before because before I, I saw that you were sharing something that was like black and white. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know what yeah. that was. <clears throat> yeah, it's not the same. It's not the globe and world. I don't know if I have, let me, I mean, I can find that, but this was like, um, there mm -hmm. are, yeah, it, it's actually, so sometimes I do one of one commission. So it's actually um, some folks who saw a piece and they're looking for, they want to um, commission a one of one. And so I'm like getting into an old um, sketch. Like I'm in a way I'm recreating it. Cause I don't, sometimes I don't have everything. 
So I'm tr almost trying to figure out like, what was I thinking and how was I working? But here there's like, it's like these very small um, pieces of light that are um, casting shadows. Right now they're a little bit too small, I think, but I could probably, brah, I don't know what I could do. I can make them bigger somewhere. I have to remember where. Um, so um, my code's a mess that I mentioned before. It's like looking into this box. Um, let me find that object. Um, yeah, didn't expect to be sharing my code on screen today. Uh, um, but for example, I can make these lines longer. Um, and now it's like there, it's easier to kind of read the animation. Um, and so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of like, yeah, play, kind of hang out with it, try to push it in a different direction, see what the vibe is like. And, um, and the way I created the piece for the the exhibit was exactly like that. Like I had mm -hmm. done a sketch with the globe. I had done some experiments zooming in and kind of like pushed it and and tweaked it to the point where I felt really happy with the output. That's beautiful. Um, I see a lot of uh, great reactions in the community <laughs> as well. Um, so thank you so much for, yeah. for sharing all this. I will leave the screen sharing um, just now. I want to tell the people in the community if you have any more questions, uh, please send them out just now. We're going to close the session um, in a little bit. So any questions that you have, shoot them out. We're going to be able to, to cover them. Um, I really, I absolutely love this session. Like I wouldn't want to, <laughs> to close it at all. <laughs> It's been incredible. It's been incredible. Thank you so, so much for, for doing this and, thank, and taking the time as well. Um, I think what we usually do then at the end of, you know, the sessions, yeah. I see the people typing probably, oh no, and now there's going to be like a hundred <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you just like a, a, set, a question to like close the session a little bit, which is something that we kind of like repeat with um, yeah. the guests that we have, uh, mm -hmm. which is why is your art the art of the future? Mm. Um, it can be, it, it's a very open question. So, so interpret it as you, as you prefer, but mm. why do you think your art is the art of the future? Mm. I think the artwork that I make is exploring um, organic forms, kinetic forms, light, motion, color. Um, it's using, you know, computational technique. So it's future oriented, but I don't even, I don't even know if I agree with the question. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. So I'm in the, at the media lab. I have a group called future sketches. We're next to a group called opera of the future. Um, and I, I almost like, there's something about the word that makes me so anxious. I just think it's like, I want to make work that's about now. Like, I really think that now is important. And I want to make work, which is about kind of what are, what, what can we do with the tools that we have now? How can we talk about the now? Um, and I, for me, it's this kind of like this energy that I want to capture. I want to capture light. I want to capture movement. I want to capture kinetic, you know, feeling. Um, so yeah, I don't even know. I'm, it's probably like the worst answer to your question. No, but, yeah. no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. It's it's just, you know, a way to kind of like reflect on everything that we're doing yeah. in the AI streams is, yeah. you know, we see the big potential that artists yeah. have and the guests that we have. And we see yeah. this as, you know, something that we're going to look back at in like, 50 years, 100 yeah. years, people are going to look back at this and be like, oh, wow, you know, this really put the foundations of what we do just now. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I would say the one way or one framing or one way to think about it is like, is are you trying to make work, which is like um, the, you know, in conversation with the past? Like, are you are you trying to bring a big make a bridge between the past and the future? And I think that's something that I'm really invested in. And I think some artists want to make work, which is like last word art, which is like this, this is the fine, like after I make this work, like nobody will make work like this after me. And that some artists want to make work, which is like first word art, which is like, I've made something completely new and I've like started a conversation. And then there's like, I don't know the term for it, but it's almost like middle word art or like not first word and not last word, but making work, which is a connection. And that's something that I haven't never really articulated that, but I think that's something that I feel really excited about. 
Absolutely. That makes so sense. I think, you know, it really represents your work, this, this connection between the past and the future, and also um, the trying to challenge what we think as reality and, um, and making something new and innovative all the time, while also, you know, maintaining this human connection. I find it very, very powerful. And it was such an honor to, to get to know you and get to know your work today. It's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. There's yeah. a lot of great comments in the community as well. Um, there's Mayanka saying, um, I loved every bit of it. I bookmarked so much material to read for the weekend. <laughs> there's nice. a lot of people writing down, sharing like books and materials. So if you have yeah. any more suggestions for our audience, please jump in the discussion later and like yeah. leave some material as well. They would absolutely love that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you so much. And yeah, I think we can now close the session. Uh, we're almost at the one hour and a half. So let's uh, let's conclude like this. And thank you so much again, Zach, for taking the time. It's been absolutely yeah. wonderful. Leticia, yeah. thank you so much for being there. Thanks Joe, so. as well. <laughs> thank you so, yeah. so much. Thanks, um, thanks. Absolutely great yeah. masterclass episode. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for moderating. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Super honored and excited. To, now I'm on the Discord, so I also can jump in. And um, I just wonderful. want to say thank, thank you to everybody. Guys, don't go anywhere. He's going to the Discord. So let's all let's all drop in there. Thank you so much, Zach. Okay, and uh, big big thank you to Federica for, for all of the effort every single week. So see you next week, yeah, guys. You. Um, you already just have a good reminder. Just with a reminder, <laughs> next week we're gonna have IX shells in the masterclass Friday. So keep your reminder. So IX shells okay. next week. Check out the events, guys. It's on the top left-hand corner of the Discord. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.